What's up, everybody? How do you convince your friends that Calvinism is true? Well, I actually got that question twice yesterday, so I guess I'm predestined to talk about that particular topic today. How are you doing today? My name is Matthew. I'm one of the pastors at Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed, Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church like that, please come check us out. Well, somebody emailed me with the question that they're debating their friends on the Bible, and Calvinism came up, and they're wanting to know, how can I defend Calvinism? How can I convince my friends that Calvinism is true? Let me try to take that on for you this morning. First of all, you don't have to convince anybody of anything. Um, it's not your responsibility to change their mind. It's not like you can reach into their heart and uh, pull it out and recalibrate it and rewire it. It's not like it's your responsibility to crack open their mind and uh, change the gear so that they see things the way that you see things. So first of all, you can kind of disabuse yourself of the responsibility. You don't have to convince anybody of anything. In fact, uh, that's kind of the point of Calvinism, that the Lord works in his own time and his own way, and God's going to do what the Lord's going to do in people's minds and in their lives and in their understandings. And yet, of course, we're praying for all of ourselves that we would have better understandings of what the scripture teaches. And certainly you yourself are on a journey, aren't you, brother? Uh, probably the things that you believe today, uh, you have modified in the last 10 years or the last 15 years. You're probably on a journey yourself a little bit to understanding things more deeply. In fact, if you were to outline your own systematic theology right now versus what you believe 10 years ago, you probably find that uh, you've matured quite a bit. And that's kind of a glorious thing for us that we're all on a journey. And so you know, the first thing I'd say is it's not your responsibility. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to convince people of divine and biblical truth. So you can kind of relax and know that you don't have to, you don't have to rewire your friend's entire systematic theology to get him to agree with you. And that's kind of a nice, kind of a nice, uh, a nice comfort there. But I think probably what you really want to do, first of all, is maybe uh, shift up the terms a little bit. I think Calvinism kind of comes into the whole topic with a lot of baggage, and it's not necessarily the term that I would use first off in order to try to defend my understanding of how theology works to my friends. I would probably prefer the term Reformed theology for the following reasons. First, the baggage implied with Calvinism, but secondly, you know, if people define Calvinism as merely the tulip doctrines, you know, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, you know, there's actually a lot more to it, which is why I really prefer Reformed theology. Reformed theology brings in the five solas. It brings in the idea of covenant theology. It brings in the ideas of confessional theology. So if anything, Calvinism might be described as a little bit too narrow. Now, you know, honestly, Calvin taught a whole lot of things, and he doesn't even really get to predestination until the third part of his institutes. So Calvin, that's even truncating Calvin. It's not really fair to Calvin to, to just reduce Calvinism to those five points. But that notwithstanding, I don't think that's your starting place, to be honest. I think your starting place is with the Holy Scriptures themselves. And so one of the things that you should do or could do when these kinds of topics come up, like predestination versus the free will, is just say to your friend, hey, listen, we're Bible-believing Christians, right? If we can agree that the Bible is the starting place, let's just ag agree that we're going to go wherever the Bible takes us. And then you're going to show them your text. You're going to lay out your cards on, on the table and say, this is why I've come to the following conclusions. And you're going to show them Ephesians 1 and take them through it. And don't just point out the word, but point out the sentence and the paragraph and the context. It's there in the text, and it's pretty hard to refute the predestinarian teaching of Ephesians 1. And then do the same thing with Romans 8. Right, you've got the ordo salutis there in Romans chapter eight. You've got Romans nine, which is um, John Piper called it the text that's like a lion that goes around devouring Arminians, right? Because it's just so obviously a defense of the sovereignty of God. Take them to the book of Acts and show them the conversion of the apostle Paul, and then take them to all of the verses throughout the Scripture, like Acts thirteen forty eight, which says, "All who were appointed to eternal life believed." And so you can just do that, and then what you do is you sit back and you say, okay, there's my case. What's your case? And just listen to your friend. Give them the opportunity to share their case from Scripture. Hopefully they have one. Part of my fear is that just the language of predestination or election or Calvinism, it just kind of rings these alarm bells in people's minds. And all of a sudden, usually what happens to me is people start retreating to 
what I would consider less legitimate defenses. That would be sort of philosophical arguments that they import into it. They'll start saying things well, like, if this is true, then I guess we're just robots. Or if this is true, then God forces people to do evil or something like that. And again, you say, show me your texts. We agreed that we're going to go wherever scripture takes us. And then not only that, but, but here's something I think would be imminently practical, as you say to them as well. Let's agree to narrow the confines of our discussion just to the teachings of Jesus then. If, if we disagree on the writings of Paul, what does Jesus say on this matter? Now, let's just clarify here. The red letters of the Bible are no more inspired than any other letters, right? Okay, so Jesus' teachings in the Bible are inspired, inerrant, infallible. So also with Paul's writings or John or Mark or Luke or anyone else. But it is interesting to confine the discussion to the teachings of Jesus because it's very, very compelling. So what you're going to do is you're going to take him to John 3 and you're going to see that the person must be born again. And that being born again precedes seeing and entering into the kingdom of God. Right? Then you're going to take him to John chapter 6 and you're going to see how Jesus himself says, Nobody can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father or that uh, the Father draws him, John 6 44 and 65 are those verses. And then take them to John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus on the night where, where he is betrayed. And it is so clearly um, election-based and predestinarian, predestinarian in the way that Jesus discusses what happened before the foundation of the earth and the distinction made between his people and the unbelieving world. Just take them through those texts. And whenever your friend begins to kind of default back to those robot arguments, just say, now wait, we, we agreed that we're only going to confine our belief structure to the words of Holy Scripture itself, right? Now, um, having set aside Calvin and Calvinism all the way to this point, I really don't think it's best to bring Calvin up as a historical figure until this point. Of course, you could talk about Pelagius and Augustine and Calvin and Luther and the Westminster Divines and all this stuff if you want to. But I think at some point you could reasonably ask your friend, have you actually read any of John Calvin before we confine him to the dumpster heap of, of history, the, the flaming pile of heretics on the stake? Have you actually read him? Maybe it would be a good thing for us to actually read some of what Calvin says in his Institutes. Now, granted, that's a big, long book, but there's a lot of things in there that you could agree to read and just honestly survey the data of what Calvin says or his commentaries or things like that. If that's too much, and it probably is too much for these kinds of like hallway or, or coffee table conversations, maybe you could challenge that person to read just a short little biography on who Calvin was so they understand who he is. John Piper has a nice little one. I'm going to link it in the description of this video so you can grab it. It's just a tiny little biography. I think it's very helpful. Hopefully it's still in print. Also, you could also take them to Charles Spurgeon. Everybody loves Spurgeon, right? Everybody agrees that he's the man. Uh, Spurgeon is so lovable. Well, Spurgeon has a nice little booklet called A Defense of Calvinism in which he actually goes through the main tenets of Calvinism and he defends it from a biblical and reason, very reasonable perspective. Okay, so you, could, so you could do those things as well. But again, at the end of the day, my friends, um, allow the Lord time to work in your friends' hearts. Um, don't try to force your opinions on them, but just consistently and faithfully point them back to the biblical scriptures. I think that's probably going to be your best road going forward. All right. Well, hopefully that video was helpful. Thank you so much for checking in. I do love you lots and we'll talk to you later.